begin. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Victoria Burge. I'm welcoming you today um, as an uninvited guest on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. As the education coordinator of adult programming here at the Kelowna Art Gallery and on behalf of the board of directors and staff, I'd like to respect, respectfully acknowledge that we operate, gather and benefit every day on the land of the Silks Okanagan Nation. Um, now tonight we are joined by three wonderful artists, um, hopefully four, Erica Walker should be on her way here. Um, and we have uh, the Kelowna Art Gallery's curator, Christine May, who will be taking over in just a few moments. Firstly, though, I'd just like to mention that um, we are recording this for uh, future viewing, so it will be up on our website next week if you know of anyone who'd like to check it out at a later date. Um, and if you have any questions for any of the audience or any of the artists today, please save them for near the end of, of the hour and uh, just type them into the chat menu below and we'll try to get to as many as we can. All right, well, I'll hand it over to Christine from here. Thank you and enjoy the talk, everybody. Okay, welcome everybody and thank you artists so much for joining in on this discussion. I'm excited to chat with you all. Um, the first thing I'll do is introduce everybody, um, starting with Briar Craig. So thanks Briar for joining us. Uh, Briar Craig is an artist and professor of printmaking, photography and drawing at UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. He has exhibited over 25 uh, in over 25 solo exhibitions, including Read Me, which is currently on view at the Kelowna Art Gallery, uh, and in hundreds of other group exhibitions. In 2009, Craig co-founded the Okanagan Print Triennial. So thanks again, Briar, for being here. Uh, and I'll next introduce Jill Ho Yu. Uh, Jill is an artist and assistant professor in print media at the Alberta University of Arts in Calgary. Her practice explores the intersection of trauma, embodied memory, and the environment. And her work has been featured internationally in numerous solo and group exhibitions. So welcome, Jill. Uh, and Robert Trzeski, um, nice to meet you and thanks for being here. Rob is an artist and a professor of printmaking in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. He has exhibited and lectured across Canada as well as internationally and in 2018, he was visiting professor at the Kyoto University of Art in uh, Art and Design in Japan. So welcome. Uh, and we hope to have Erica Walker join us as well. So um, I'll do a brief introduction of Erica. Uh, Erica is a Nova Scotia based artist who exhibits throughout North America and internationally. She is an associate professor of art at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax. And she was the Okanagan Print Triennial winner in 2018. And her solo show called A Decaying Fort and a Lack of Guidance was presented uh, here at the Kelowna Art Gallery in 2021. So hopefully we'll be hearing from her, her shortly as well. Uh, so what I'll do is I have um, a few questions that I want to ask in getting the conversation started. And the first one is always of interest to um, any, any, all of us who are artists and non-artists alike. So what we'd really like to know is um, if you could tell us how you got your start as an artist and did you always know that you would pursue a creative path? So maybe um, Briar, we'll start with you. All right. Okay. Um, I, I didn't always know that I was going to be, that I wanted to be an artist. In fact, I, I still have a hard time consider, uh, calling myself an artist. It's been a long time, but it still feels like one of those things that sticks in my throat when I say it, because it sounds so snotty. I'm an artist. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was, I was going to be a veterinarian. And, and when I was a younger kid, I wanted to be in the RCMP because I wanted to ride a horse and wear a cool red uniform. Um, but uh, um, it was, it, I really, I think it was in high school when uh, I started hating science that I realized that I, I was going to go to university, but I better go for something that I enjoyed doing. And visual art made sense. Um, so yeah, and, and I had no aspirations necessarily beyond that BFA degree. Uh, but then I got into grad school and everything just sort of snowballed from there. I've been really lucky. Things have just fallen in place as, as time has gone on. So, but I'm kind of interested to hear what, what the other, how the others feel. Mm -hmm. Well, Rob, why don't we jump to you next? Sure. Um, I would agree with, with Briar. I think many artists uh, have that situation where they're like, yeah, I'm not an artist because that doesn't quite, you know, like it's awfully high fluting or it's, you know, you're separating yourself from the non-artists or something like that. And I think most most good artists, not all, but most good artists probably have that instinct. Um, 
when I, I, when I was in high school, like I did well in high school and I didn't have to try too hard and I enjoyed high school, a lot of fun. Um, but I really liked art and that's where I kind of met, uh, some people that weren't my normal kind of group of friends. And uh, I took lots of art classes and I had a fantastic art teacher named Mrs. Martelli. And um, uh, I didn't really know that I wanted to be an artist, but I did know that I wanted to go to university. And uh, I went on a trip to Queens University. Um, it was about three and a half hours from where I lived with a, a friend whose older sister was at Queens. And, you know, I was like a 18 year old and they showed us a real good time and I thought boy I would like to go to university here and my teacher at back in high school was like you know Rob I won't do the accent for you but uh you know Rob uh you know you could go to art you could university for art and so um I said cool and uh long story short I ended up at Queen's in the BFA program uh, and the whole Queen's experience set you know it was a pivot point that set my life on a certain particular path um, but honestly, I didn't even realize that I wanted to be an artist until I, until I got to printmaking. Uh, and I thought, wow, I would really like to be like this prof, Otis Temeshevskis, and I would really like to do all this neat stuff and be around other weirdos who want to do neat stuff and stay up late and be different than my art, my other friends who are in economics and all that other sort of stuff. Um, and that's what kind of, at that point, you know, at about age 20 or so, I said, Oh, you know, being an artist, I think, artist prof, little did I know how hard that would be, but an artist, that's, that's the thing for me, and I'm going to figure out how to do it. Uh -huh. So that's, that's where my start came from. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jill, what about you? Um, I, I think as a kid, uh, I was super into drawing and really loved that. So I think as a kid, I wanted to be an artist. But then as I got older, and I realized that stuff like employment and money matters. Mm -hmm. um, I was sort of like, oh, I can't, can't do that. There's no, you know, there's, there's sort of no career path in that. Um, so I actually did an undergrad in psychology and thought I was going to be a psychologist um, and um, finished that and then sort of realized, like, I think I was just too young to maybe pursue something like that. Mm -hmm. So it took some time off um, and then was like, I need to do something with my life. So I decided to go back to university and I thought I might be like a high school art teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of the, the program that I went to, you were also supposed to take studio classes to do it. And I just fell back in love with making art. And then I was like, oh, forget the art education classes all I wanted to do was the studio classes and then sort of just like Briar like I got into grad school and then was like I'm gonna give the art slash post-secondary teaching career a shot and here I am <laughs> amazing yeah it's interesting to hear you know, your thoughts as a young person entering university can change so much. And um, it's interesting to hear how all of you kind of got to the point where you are. Um, I think Eric Walker may be here. So I'll just give it one moment, Victoria, if you have to do anything to, to let her in. I see, I see Erica, so I'm here, definitely. I'm here. You're here. Oh, I see you now, Erica. Hi. I'm so sorry, Christine. Oh, so hey. I swear that Pacific Standard is sometimes five hours apart from us, isn't oh, wow. it? Time change. It's you don't like change. That. We yeah we yeah it's confusing, but I'm glad you're here. I am so um, glad I'm here, and I'm and I'm so sorry to my esteemed colleagues for missing a little pre pre-game check-in. I really was looking forward to talking to the three of you, uh, maybe afterwards, hopefully. Yeah, so well, I gather we, you're yeah. ask, we asking. All, I'll, uh, I'll recap the question so that you can catch okay. up and, and you're here at the perfect time. So I was just asking everyone to tell uh, us about you, how you got your start as an artist and if you always knew that you wanted to be an artist. <laughs> Yeah, what what Jill said about, you know, always as a young person thinking like, yeah, this 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 art thing is is really it. This is so rad. 
of course I'm going to do this. And then becoming, you know, like growing up and realizing, oh, wait, you know, being an adult means these other responsibilities. How is that going to ever work? So I didn't, I didn't ever think there was a career in it for me. Um, and, and I think even moving from adolescence to adulthood, I, I never thought highly enough of myself to imagine I had something you know, significant enough to share that it could really work for me. Um, but, but like uh, Rob said, I want to do this neat shit. <laughs> and that's what happened in, um, in college. And I, and I stumbled into a print class by kind of by accident. I had a professor who recruited me from a drawing class that I'm so embarrassed to admit that I took for in, enrichment. I, I shouldn't say embarrassed, but, but sometimes I, I, I won't get into that. <laughs> Never mind. I took this drawing class in at the university level um, because I was just curious. I was still making stuff all the time. I always, you know, realize when I look back, it wasn't just drawing. I was always making shit like from um, from leftover food. From yeah, I was making dioramas as a child. I was making environments, and then I. And then I started getting into these jobs where I was also making things, making objects, making environments as well. And um, it's, yeah, I'm really fortunate that I'm one of those lucky folks that found an actual profession to pay the bills. Like, wow, I thought that was always such a dream that was never gonna happen. Lo and behold, it's, a, <laughs> it's complicated, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and that leads well into our next question, because you mentioned, you know, you kind of stumbled upon this printmaking class um, unintentionally. And so the next question is, how did you first become interested in printmaking? And why printmaking opposed to other mediums? Mm. Um, so Erica, maybe since you were talking about it, you can continue. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that kind of bleeds nicely. Um, well, I, I, I grew up in a really rural part of the world in, in southeastern Wisconsin. And it was, it was just a very, I, I guess, for lack of a better adjective, just a very kind of rough physical um, world. My existence was very comfortable, but, you know, I was surrounded by wood and metal and dirt and grime. And then the jobs I ended up taking as a young person like I worked at a metal foundry. Uh, I did a lot of landscaping, highway construction. Um, so cutting metal, filing metal, sharpening tools, like all of these very physical pursuits. It just, printmaking was a really good fit. And, and that, I didn't really realize that till someone wrote me a letter of recommendation that they shared with me like years later that kind of talked about like my, you know, my labor background being this great fit, um, this maintenance mentality that I think you learn when you're, you know, involved in that world. Um, but it's, for me, it was always a surprise because I thought I was such a sucker for immediate gratification. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around why printmaking? Like this, this the delay here is so frustrating and I'm I was terrible at it for years, I think I sucked. Um, but it, uh, I think that also that roughness that I talked about, like this, the, the, for those of you that don't know a lot about printmaking, we do a lot of sort of removal of material and, and eating away at metal with acids and our hands get really gnarly and the ink is very messy. And um, sometimes there's a lot of physicality and coordination involved. It's, it marries really well with this other part of it clean and, and slick and I think that balances out this roughness in this really nice way that psychologically um, felt yeah balanced to me yeah that's enough yeah no that's really well put and it does seem like um, your background well it all kind of aligns or it was all kind of meant to be anyway so mm -hmm. um, Briar do you want to talk about how you found printmaking and and why you stuck with it well, it's probably, it's probably very similar. I mean, Erica talked about being recruited fr from a drawing class by, by somebody and Rob talked about going to Queens and, and seeing the professors there. 
that was kind of it. I, I started at, I went to Queens as well. Um, I'm, I'm right. considerably older than Rob, but that's <laughs> beside the point. Um, different era, same profs though. Um, but it was really my first, my, the first module that we did at, at Queens was being taught by Carl Haywood, who was uh, one of the pr printing professors who taught a bunch of different things, but mostly screen printing. Um, and uh, I just thought he was the coolest dude. He had a really interesting way of looking at things. He had an interesting way of talking about things. It was a kind of sarca sarcastic, kind of sardonic nature to, to the way he responded to things. And it just made sense to me. And literally at that moment in my naivete, I was, I, I'm gonna be a printmaker. And this was way before I had a chance to take any print classes, way before I even met Otis Tamaszewskis, who's also like, he's like the Tasmanian devil of, of uh, the print world. He just sort of spins and generates energy. Um, and it was really that, that naive. I'm, if this guy is that cool and I like him this, that much, that's what I'm going to do too. And <laughs> sure enough, when I started doing it, it, I didn't, it didn't, wasn't natural to me. It didn't come naturally at all. But there was something about it that I enjoyed. And I think maybe as Erica was saying too, you know, there's that, that, that delay that happens. And I quite like that rest period where you're just going through the motions of doing something technical. I've made some aesthetic decisions. I'm doing technical things and some small decisions along the way, but I, I enjoy the labor of it. And, and probably a similar background. I did a lot of, I worked construction for years um, as a teenager and, and early in my early twenties. And I just really liked that physical nature of making things and print just made sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my major was printmaking. And then I kind of, my secondary era was, was sculpture because it just, it also made sense to me, but it was much noisier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All good reasons. Thank you so much, Briar. Um, Rob, what about you? <clears throat> well, you know what I love about a panel is that uh, I'm listening to Erica talk about her background and I'm listening to Briar talk about his background. You know, like when I was a student during university, uh, I worked for the city of Hamilton and 99% of kids who worked for the city of Hamilton would plant flowers at the cemetery and drink coffee and just kind of hang around. 1% ended up in sanitation. So I wore an orange jumpsuit and hung off the back of a garbage truck for four summers. So I really learned the value uh, of beer camp, as I called university. Uh, you know, when I'd go back to Queens in the fall, um, I thought, gosh, that was an interesting experience and I'm going to take something from it. But I, I, I think I need to, I'm kind of re-answering my question about being an artist in a way. Um, I didn't really want to do that for my whole life. I wanted to figure out how to do these more fun things and hang around with other weirdos and stuff. Um, if you'll permit me, I'm going to share my screen just to show you all one image here. Um, and let's see, hopefully this works. Uh, I hope that you can see a black and white image uh, of a face with a, okay. So this is um, an uh, intaglio print. This was done by Jan Winton. Jan Winton also one of the profs at Queens, uh, mostly uh, in painting and drawing, but Jan was also a, um, uh, is also a printmaker and married to Otis Tamaszewskis, who incidentally, I named my, my one and only blonde haired son after uh, Otis. Um, but anyways, this, this piece, uh, I actually have, I took this off the web, so I'm sorry if it's not great, uh, if it's not a great image, but uh, I have this piece up in my house framed. It's big. It's 30 by 42. It's you go up the, as you go up the stairs, you kind of like walk into this thing the whole way up, get some light from the side of the house. And um, I absolutely love this piece. Um, but the reason why I love this piece, the reason why I love, uh, there's a Otis piece back there. There's a Carl Haywood over there. I got a Briar, Hay I've got a Briar Craig around the corner and a Mark Bovey and all these others. Um, I've, I've surrounded, I surrounded, uh, later on, I've surrounded myself with pieces by people who are important to me uh, as I think about my life as an artist and my career as an artist, but particularly with pieces that mean something to me, this piece called R uh, is a photo etching, there's dry point, it's really, it's wiped very, very creatively. Um, there's a lot of retrousage and all these other fancy things going on, but it's this beautiful gestural thing. And I was in my second year uh, mono printing module at Queens being taught by Jan Winton. I didn't really know much about printmaking other than a little taste I'd had in high school. And I saw this plate, uh, as I think back to it, this is a very key moment for me. It was a brass plate, pretty large, you know, the, the image, the image itself is uh, probably 20 inches by 30 inches or something. And I just saw this plate and Jan didn't print it, but it came out with all this stuff. And I, and I, honest to God, I said, what am I looking at? Like, how can this thing be a thing? That's a photograph on that piece of, like it, I'd never, 
I'd never seen a thing like this in my life, never before in my life. And I was just like, my mouth hung open. And I said, holy shit, like what? And I still, I have that same kind of like, I can feel my blood. I can feel the blood pressure kind of rising as I think about this piece, which is why I'm so happy to have the actual piece in my house. But I saw this thing and I said, Jesus Christ, I need to figure out how, how, what this means, what does it mean? And so I attacked the mono printing module with a kind of veracity that was rarely seen amongst my classmates, as I've been told. Um, and that was really what got me started on printmaking. I'd always liked photo, I'd like drawing, I like being physical and gestural, I like technical stuff, I like kind of processes, but I'd never seen it all in one package and it blew me away, absolutely blew me away. And that is the piece, um, and there's other pieces that I probably like more in my life, but that is the piece I look at every single day and it reminds me every single day uh, at that point in like 1998 where things shifted for me. Wow. So. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, that's, uh, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing. Maybe that's super dramatic, but it really, it really is. It really is that, that kind of pivot point for me. One of many, but a very, very important one. Wow. wow. It's amazing that you can almost pinpoint like exactly what kind of steered you in that direction. One of those core oh. memories, you know, like you, you don't quite realize that they're happening until they just stick with you for your whole life. Yes. Amazing. Uh, Jill, what about you? Um, so I actually took my first printmaking class kind of by accident. Um, so when I went back to university to do what was going to become a BFA, although at the time I, I thought I would do a B.Ed., um, I, I registered, I had missed like the fall term, so I had, had to start in the winter term and if anybody who's in university knows when you start in the winter term, like everything is out of sync. Um, and so I was really limited on what studio classes I could register for. And I saw this class called um, Silkscreen and I was like, what is this? And I was like, well, if I'm gonna go to university, I may as well try a class that like, I don't know what it is. It's not something that I can, you know, like, do wherever we certainly didn't learn it in high school or anything like that so i just registered for it um and um like so many of the other panelists here i had a really amazing teacher in my undergrad i had um bill lang who's now like um emeritus professor at university of calgary and like bill was i mean he's like my print dad <laughs> like he encouraged all the students um he was he's like an excellent teacher and he really showed his students respect but also like tough love and I found like as a student that really jived with me and so after I took that one class I was like oh there's all these other different kinds of printmaking um, so then I, you know, took other, I took like etching after that. And I really fell in love with that class particularly. Um, I think in part because like as a kid, I was always into like bugs and dinosaurs and biology. And I was also really into looking at old, um, you know, biological or like anatomical illustrations that are, you know, were made with engraving. And like etching is the closest thing to that. And so when I learned that technique, I was like super excited because I was like, oh, this is like all the, the cool books that I like looking at. And so that really stuck with me. And I've sort of been, um, I mean, I've been stuck on etching ever since then, so. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll move on to our next question, um, which is really, helpful for those of us who aren't artists. I always love learning about process. Um, so if you can talk to us a, a bit about the printmaking process and um, how you work up from an idea or a sketch uh, into actually creating a print. So um, Erica, if you want to start, that would be great. Oh, I think you're muted. Yep, thanks. Am I able to share my screen? Is that all worked yeah. out or? Okay, cool. Um, it's, you know, I don't, I don't want to take up too much time talking about this because I, it is something it's so 
it's a, it's so much of of my practice is about this for all of us i suppose we could talk for an hour or two about what you know where does it come from and then where does it like where do we take it and how does it manifest physically because there's so many different layers to what all of all of us are doing um so i'm going to try to to be brief but i i have this there's this one part of my practice that is primarily these like poster works that i started maybe back in 2010 um, and they're very prescriptive. The way it all begins is um, it's, it's kind of, it's very, by prescriptive, I guess I mean, it, everything's planned. I have a vision in my head. I can actually see it in a mock-up on the screen, on my screen. And then I do these things to manipulate lithography um, to do exactly what I want it to do instead of allowing for mm -hmm. chance and circumstance and, and intuition. I do have another part of my practice where I, I do let more of that come in and it's a little bit more exciting. It's, it's a lot more exciting, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's kind of more wishy-washy to talk about it. Um, but I'll show, let me just share, which screen shall I share? We'll do this one so that you can see, um, can you see my search for the time in British Columbia? Yeah. <laughs> I had this, this little feeling, I was like, shoot, do they do daylight savings time? Mm -hmm. um, where am I? Okay. So, oh, that's Illustrator and this, yeah, Illustrator. So, what happens is, there we go. These, what you're looking at are gazillions of little thumbnails of these images that I want to use. I wanna make them into prints. Before this even starts, I get myself really embroiled in, in some kind of, um, chunk of, of current events or current realities that have deep historical roots. And I'm looking to kind of exploit the confusing angles from which we can look at those stories as humans and how that intersects with propaganda, generally speaking. So um, I find, like, let's say it's resource extraction, for example, or in this case, we're looking at images of, um, of men working on aircraft carrier flight decks. Before th these images came to be, there were like probably months of, of reading, watching documentaries, um, reading the Pentagon Papers, which is this Department of Defense document that's you know thousands of pages long. And there's the, that's a, a really rich part of it for me is getting excited about you know, learning what I should have maybe learned in school that never stuck and finding an intimate way into these things um, that's also current, but also past. Anyway, so there's these sketches or even these manipulated photographs, they go into these thumbnails and this is a series that I'm working on. And this happens with a lot of the other poster work as well. And then I have all these thumbnails of text and then I have all of these, pieces of text that are things that Lyndon B. Johnson said, or things that my father said, or things that his, his service buddies said. And on one column, you have all of the, you know, the things that, that not real humans, but, but innocent humans had to say about the Vietnam War, for example. And then on the left um, are things that Johnson said, or that Robert McNamara said, or, um, and then they start getting combined in this really messy, chaotic um, mm -hmm. illustrator document, which is so kind of sterile and boring compared to what happens in the studio. Um, anyway, none of this is actual output that I use. It's all just how I think and how I plan and how I do measurement calculations some of this stuff gets like outlines get printed out and then I do the text, um, like I'll hand draw the, the text like this. Um, that feels really important to me. 
Um, and, and so in that way, my, my lithographic practice is, like I said, it's kind of this happens, then this happens, and then, and that, and then I learn very little through that process, what I'm, you know, where the learning happens or where the, the I guess, revealing happens is um, perhaps a year later when I look back at the work and I realize what was happening subconsciously, why I chose those images and that text together. Um, because when that's happening, it's all just very automatic and kind of fury, like this looks right, feels right, sounds right with this guy or with this machine. And I'm just gonna trust that. Um, but yeah, I think I've kind of talked long enough about that. Well, Eric, I'm curious. Well, it's very cool, first of all, to be able to see all these ideas, kind of how you organize them. Mm. But of all of those little thumbnails on that document, how many mm. final ideas are there or final pieces are there? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, because I often start a series thinking there's going to be 20 or 50. I'm working on another one right now where I think there's going to be 100 different explosions like mm -hmm. I'm going to take all these explosions from history up into the current military conflicts and there's going to be a hundred and um I've always been like that I don't know if the rest of you are but like I'm going to do all these huge wonderful things and and but in reality of those thumbnails probably probably 15. Wow okay I would like yeah so there's maybe so you narrow it down quite a bit yeah, oh, quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you, Erica. Um, Briar, would you like to, to speak to this next? Sure. Um, well, it, it, interesting, I think that like Erica, I, I always have all kinds of things in my head that I want to do. And but I have I have the brain of that dog from the movie up and yes. squirrel. And off, you know, off I go in another direction. So every time I start a series, it, it gets two or three images in and then squirrel and then I'm doing something else and I might come back I think I jump back and forth between things all the time um, but really for me I think it's just I've been collecting sort of weird bits of detritus for years and um, her overheard conversations and overheard and misheard conversations um, scraps of paper that I found on the street typically the things that that interest me are things that are unfinished that it's it's half of a headline from a newspaper or somehow um, something that's interrupted some, in some way. And that to me just sort of sparks my, my imagination. I think I, I, I'm, a, I'm a game player in that way. I like to play games and, and try to rearrange things in my head. Often when I'm looking, I'm, even as Eric was talking, I was looking at the Kelowna Art Gallery and I was trying to think how many words that I, could I make out of that um, by rearranging the letters. And that's just sort of how, how, I, how I kind of digest things is, is by letting my head go in different directions. Um, so I think that's it. I just collect stuff and maybe like Erica, every once in a while you think in that pile of things on your desk, two things are sitting together for the first time and you go, whoa, that's kind of cool. They're doing something interesting. And then that just starts the, starts the process. Um, I would love to say that my work is full of invention and full of, of experimentation. And for me, it seems like it is, but I think it doesn't look like it. It looks very precise and very calculated and very precisely printed and that sort of thing. But I think for me, it's always, I never really know what's gonna happen when I start. And things head off in different, different directions. They may not be dramatically weird or wonderful, but that's the thing I like about print too, no matter how much, you, how much I plan to make something look like this, as soon as I start printing, it's not looking like that at all. And I always feel like I'm scrambling to catch up with the, the crazy crap that the, the medium itself did. And, and for me, that's the fun of it. It's, there's this kind of, I, I often say to my classes, it's like having a slightly evil collaborator that will take your best intentions and then go, no, not today, mister. And then something weird will happen. And you have to react to that and just deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the part I like. It, it feels very, very controlled, but it doesn't feel controlled at all. I don't know if that answered the question, but I, I think I- Oh, I, it answered it perfectly. Thank you, Briar. Uh, Rob, what about you? I'm struggling now to uh, remember what the initial oh. question was. I was just kind of lost in Erica and, and Briar talking about 
No, okay. it's it's totally fine. So yeah, if you talk to us about the, your your printmaking process and mm -hmm. how you work up from an idea. Uh, okay, so um, I keep uh, like I have a studio at the university. It's, I'm very fortunate. It's a nice big studio. The only downside is that you have to pass through the main printmaking area to get to my studio. So I'm trapped, and my students know when I'm there, uh, okay. which is kind of okay. Which is kind of okay. But um, I keep really uh, during normal times very regular kind of business hours at the studio. I go in Monday to Friday, usually in by 8.30. I'm usually gone by 5.30. Um, but that's really where the business ends uh, because the reality is that what I really like to do, I'm going to share my screen again. I was scrambling to try to find a picture of my, uh, my. let's hopefully you can see, yeah, you'll be able to see this. This is not a new picture. It's a couple years old, but this is some of my studio and it, it extends to the right of the picture. Um, uh, as well into a kind of a more formal office space and stuff. But I kind of, I ride my bike in rain or shine, uh, snow or ice or sun every day, every work day of the year in Regina where it gets really cold. And I flop down on my couch, which is right behind me in this picture. And I sit down and I just kind of look at all my stuff. And I look at all of my bikes. I think there's probably three bikes that I can see in this space, uh, my newer, picture. I've got five bikes in the studio right now. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've got some woodworking stuff off to the left, off in the far back, right? I don't know if there's a mouse that you can see, but um, there is a uh, kind of a hydroponic station where I grow tomatoes and lettuce and stuff in the studio. And I'm kind of the king of my own castle down in the printmaking area at the U of R. Nobody asks what I'm up to. I don't set the place on fire and I just uh, kind of have assembled my loyal my loyal kind of band of students. And so I'm kind of left to my own devices. But what I'm getting at is that I rarely go in and work all day long on a given project or all day long every day for 10 days or 20 days or 30 days. I might go in, I might put some photo etching film on a copper plate because I've got some ideas that I want to kind of work with uh, from some, some old books that I have found. Uh, I am swapping out parts on my bike. I am sandblasting and painting parts on my little sports car. Uh, I am doing some woodworking stuff. I'm growing tomatoes. I'm making uh, Instagram videos of me eating homemade ramen with vegetables that I've grown in my studio. And the, the, the idea here is really that I just spend my time uh, in my space. I really spend my time in my space. And there's no doubt about it. I come home and there's my stuff is here. And, but I have to compete with three offspring and a partner who's also busy. Uh, and I've got enough to do here. I've got an old house that I'm always renovating, but I'm kind of constantly working a bit on a thing and then on a bit on the next thing. And it's not like um, start and then never finish. It's kind of like I can only work on a thing and put everything I need into that thing for a particular amount of time before maybe it's the squirrel. Maybe it's a uh, it's, uh, briar squirrel. I go, you know, that bottom bracket needs to come out of that bike before I ride it again in a month because it was making some funny noises. And I'm not going to get through the winter uh, on that bike if I don't do some work on it. Uh, and then I'm like, well, and I'm upstairs, I'm meeting with other students and I'm bringing, I'm bringing uh, visiting artists and friends in. And so really the studio, um, which is the only place that I think sounds a little hoity-toity. We were talking about, you know, being an artist and, you know, sounding like maybe it's a little bit elite to call yourself an artist, but the studio is one of these places that I've talked about since as long uh, back as I can remember as an undergrad student going to the studio. And many people are like, oh, the studio. But the studio is just the place where all my stuff is. And that's where it all comes from. And so I can, I can kind of uh, listen to music and I can watch Netflix while I'm working. I can just kind of like while away my time doing something that doesn't seem like it means anything, but in fact, it really means almost everything. Uh, and I can flop over to my computer and I can work some uh, sketches up digitally. I can run out into the studio, which I've kind of assembled over 15 years, uh, the students, you know, the university studio and do a little something and then jump back in. And, um, and, that, and that's really what my process is about. And every once in a while I have to buckle down and bleh, print like crazy to get a show or uh, I've shifted out of printing and I'm working on some like wood and light installations for a bit and I need to like you know focus and get down to it but my happiest times are these these times where I'm not I'm not doing anything because again like that's when it's all happening for me 
hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. It does. And your studio looks amazing. So okay. it sounds like it's kind of this place where, I mean, you're not doing a ton of research to come up with ideas. You're just letting them come to you naturally in the moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, like they, they come to me and then I can do those deep dives that I need yeah. to do, you know, but yeah. I've, I've always enjoyed the idea of uh, Professor Potts, Caractacus Potts from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the workshop. <laughs> The, the place where you fix the house, the place where you build a car, the place where you invent some crazy thing, the place where, you know, it all, you just kind of let the world around you, uh, you know, give yourself the time to like use. It's such a, an amazing, an amazing job. I think my colleagues here will agree to be in a position where you get to try all these things, teach all these things, be around creative people and have that creativity. Uh, and sometimes that open-ended creativity really, um, you know, have it, have it be uh, a thing that is valued. I mean, there's really nothing like it. And so one day uh, I will be found underneath a pile of old newspapers or something in my studio and my children or grandchildren will have to come and collect my stuff. But in the meantime, that's where I'm going to be. And that's where I'm kind of most happy. Great. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and Jill, can you speak a bit to your process as well? Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen and put some images of my work up and I'll just talk over them. Um, so like pretty much everyone else on the panel, um, I'm a bit of a magpie when it comes to just collecting like reference materials. Um, so for me, oops, sorry. For me, what I tend to do is like, I'll come up with an idea or I'll be like, oh, I, I need to see what broken concrete looks like. Um, so, you know, if I'm out and about and I see broken concrete, I'll photograph it. Um, but a lot of um, the source material I get, it will just be from like Google image searches. So I'll spend days just Google image searching whatever I'm kind of interested in. Um, and then I'll just build like huge folders of images. And then once I have those, I just actually spend a long time just looking through the images. Um, I'll just look and then I'll sort of kind of just let all that stuff stew in my head. I'll do some sketching. And then um, if I'm working like traditionally in print, like this piece that you see up on my desktop, um, you know, I'll, I'll sketch it. Part of my, part of the thing I like to do as a creative person is I like to try and take different kind of disparate elements. And I like to try and like smash them together visually and see if they can sort of live in the same kind of like universe. Um, so yeah, I'll make sketches and then do all that printmaking magic, like thinking of how to layer things and put things together and be really strategic about that. And then um, get down to the, the real elbow grease of actually making what I want into an actual print. And um, Briar, I'm gonna steal your line about for future classes about um, print being like your evil collaborator. Um, I think one of the things that keeps me making prints is, I mean, as much as it's really annoying when things blow up in your face and go wrong, which they do very frequently, even for people who have made prints for decades and decades, um, there's something about, like, I think about it as sort of like a negotiation with the media. It's like, I want this, but lithography or etching or sil silkscreen wants this. And so you have this interesting, like, negotiation with, with the actual media. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then sort of a second way I work, which is still print-based, but a lot less regimented than something you see, like the example you see on the screen right now, is I'll work with the multiple. So I'll make lots of small different images um, and then I'll print them and then I'll find different ways to use them or install them or sort of play around with them. Um, 
And, and to be honest, uh, both ways of working are, are really important to me. This way is a little bit more, it's, it's less risky in a sense because the pieces are small. If they don't work out, I can just remake them. Um, so this way I, I can work a little bit more freely, um, but I still really enjoy working really traditionally um, as well. Um, I think in part because it is quite a challenge. Um, and then this is kind of related to working with the multiple, but just sort of, I wanted to show this sort of as an example of like, um, how if you're an artist, you listen to sort of what you're interested in, whether that's like symbols or ideas or, you know, um, that can, if you're in tune with what you're attracted to, that can actually take you on to making other things. So one of the symbols I've been working really commonly with has been just a symbol of like the chain link fence. Um, so I would take just, if I'd see like an interesting chain link fence, you know, when I was out and about walking, I would take photos of it. Um, and I ended up sort of like following that intuition into being like, well, what if I made like a chain link fence, but I made it out of prints. Um, so I ended up scanning a piece of chain link fence that one of our technicians was so kind to cut out of a, uh, another fence for me and then made this to scale CMYK um, replica of a chain link fence. And it's was kind of interesting because I didn't, it wasn't like I, I never started out with a plan to make this thing. Um, it was just sort of like listening to my intuition and being like, oh, well, what if I tried this next? Okay, well, what if I tried this next? So, um, so yeah, I work in both ways, like super highly, totally strategized and planned out and sort of a little bit more um, intuitive as well. Um, can I ask you a question, Jill? Is sure. Are those real shadows? Is this actually cut out and suspended in front of a wall? Yeah, so um, it's a tessellated, it's a tessellated pattern. So it's, the, uh, the original print is a CMYK, which I then tessellated digitally and then had it printed digitally because it's really large. It's like uh, six feet by like 21 feet. Um, and then I cut out all of the paper. So when it hangs, you actually get shadows. And it's, it's I mean, I know in this like detail shot, it doesn't look super convincing, but like in real life under like, you know, regular lights, it's actually quite convincing. And yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah, Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jill. I love the visuals. Oh, stop share. Got it. Okay. Um, I think this also leads nicely into the next question and talking about, you know, working with a print technician and um, using modern technology. Um, so what I would like to know is what role uh, new techniques or technologies play in, in your printmaking practice. Um, Erica, if you'd like to go first. Thanks, Christine. Um, that was, I really enjoyed that part, uh, the last little part of, of this chat. Um, this is, it's just a nice way to engage in, um, um, in these, this new era of, of Zoom talks to do a panel this way. I've really enjoyed them as, a, as an audience member too. Um, I, uh, technology is a funny one for me and I'm really, I'm excited to hear what, um, what the other panelists have to say, uh, because I know that the three of them use technology in, in some pretty crafty ways. And it's not that I don't, um, use technology, obviously that's just baked into what we do, but, um, some of the newer, sexier things, um, I'm always a bit slow, like watching from the sidelines to wait and see, like, you know, is that, is that going to work out? Is this, you know, is all this laser cutting and, you know, fancy 3D printing? Is that, you know, I'll use it when, when I'm ready, but I'm excited to just quickly share another thing uh, that's actually a really funny bit of old technology. Um, where am I? 
that I've recently been involved in. Um, I was asked to, let's see, I was asked by the Milwaukee Art Museum, I think I can talk about this now, um, to make a, an advertisement slash piece of art for their upcoming, um, they're having this massive exhibition of Jules Charest's lithographs. Um, and Jules Charest, for those of you that don't know, is considered the father of um, the father of the modern poster. Um, and he was also the one that pioneered basically C the CYMK process. So Charest, this is kind of a, a, just a snapshot of some of his work. It's probably somewhat recognizable to most of you. Um, he worked in an era when there was no such thing as CYMK. So he started using this splatter technique um, to blend, you know, to blend the primary colors or to blend any of the colors that he was interested in using. Um, so here's a close up shot of what that would have looked like. Um, the Milwaukee Art Museum, you know, they didn't, they didn't say you have to use the techniques that Charest used um, to make this piece, but, um, you know, just have, have at it. Here's your, this is, this is your budget, go make something. Um, so I knew these folks down in Santa Fe that used the same kind of press that was probably constructed in, I don't know, 1920, um, steam driven, though they've converted it to be electrically driven. Um, and I knew that they could help me um, use this process. So that was a close up of one of Charest's works. This is as well, oops, it's sideways, but you kind of get the, get the gist, oops. So I started working on, it would have been nice to work on a lithographic stone, I know, because that's what Charest would have done. Um, but since I was collaborating with these people from Santa Fe and I actually wanted to, you know, to participate. Oh, I think Eric is frozen. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are, yeah. Back. Um, Anyway, the, the whole process, it says my internet connection is unstable. So I'll just show pictures <laughs> and, and I think you all can probably put it together. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, I was just amazed that it, that it worked so well as it did. Um, that these, you know, through splattering this black ink that, I don't know, the four primary colors kind of blended together actually did what they were supposed to do. Um, and I got, I, I found myself completely immersed in this concern, like, is this splatter format too heavy? Is it too thin? How do I know that the faces of these cherubs are not going to end up looking like you know, too sunbaked or too yellow or too, you know, so these weird, these minutia that we end up kind of um, obsessing over this evil collaborator, uh, as Briar mentioned, is, is such a, it's bizarre and really hilarious sometimes. Um, so I wish on this massive um, Esprit Voran uh, printing press, but that's my little technology spiel for the moment let me get out of here okay oh thank you so much for sharing that erica super interesting uh briar do you want to talk a little bit about you know your your use of technology or you know contemporary techniques in your work it's 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 amazing to me i i, I probably use it more than i would have ever thought i would use it because I don't get it. It still I'm I'm old. I'm an old guy. I have no idea what's going on. I don't have a phone. I don't know anything about technology. Students teach me everything I, I know about color separating images and things like that because I, I'm literally as inept as they can possibly be. Um, but it's amazing. And as we were all talking, everyone talk everyone mentioned computers at some point or doing something digitally. And it's amazing to me that in the last 25 years that it's become so ubiquitous to virtually everybody's practice in some way. And, and I'm no ex exception, you know, we, we use computers now to print out photo positives and, and it enables us to do amazing things that we just, you know, you would have had to go learn to take an entire photo course to learn how to, to make photo positives that you could expose onto a screen. And it's sped things up. It's not maybe the, quite the same, but it's, it's 
you know, it, it, it does things. And um, so I'm, I'm really reluctant to go into that because I really don't get it. Mm. But I know it enough now that it feels comfortable to use. And, and as and like, like Erica was saying, I think these new things come up and you think, oh, isn't that amazing? There's my scroll for today. I can look at that thing and think, dream all the dreams that, but nothing's ever big enough. I just want to make gigantic things. And, you know, our, our laser cutter can only do 28 inches or something. Oh, damn it. But um, it, it just, it, things are happening so fast and the possibilities are, are, are coming so fast and furious that it's, it's hard to keep up with. It keeps my mind going though. It's, it's terrific to be dreaming about all the things I'd like to be doing with these amazing tools. Um, but you know, like I say, I, I think I'm, I'm, I've reluctantly gone in that direction and seem, it seems like somewhat seamlessly gone in that direction because you can yeah. and because that stuff exists and because universities, and I'm looking at a question that has been asked to, the, to, to everybody. And I think because universities have gone so thoroughly into digital technologies and they seem to be quite, free with money when it comes to, to spending money on things that, that are digital or new. So they're available and we can use them. Yeah, makes things easier. Yeah. Uh, Rob, what about you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I use technology all the time. Um, but, but I think I can say safely that I was very fortunate to have been introduced to printmaking in the mid late nineties by some older artists who really knew their stuff around kind of analog approaches to making and doing. You know, they knew their way around dark rooms. They really understood how things had to work in order for them to work. And um, as a result, I kind of came into printmaking right on the cusp of learning from these guys, Carl Haywood and um, Otis Tamaszewskis. Um, but then also Photoshop just showed up on one Mac computer you know, in the library, in the art building where I was and using and using that to, because I saw the potential, the possibilities there. And so, I, I mean, I use Photoshop, honest to goodness. I use Photoshop um, when, I'm, when I'm not on sabbatical, for instance, every single day. I use Photoshop every single day and I use an X-Acto knife every single day. And you would have never convinced me that these were truths 25 years ago, but there, it's, it's very much the case. And um, but the point I'm, I guess that I'm kind of making is that I use a computer all the time, um, but it is just a tool, you know, in the grand tradition of printing, not even printmaking, you know, like printmaking is the cousin, the kind of slower artsy cousin of printing, but in the grand tradition of printing, you know, humanity's ability to exactly reproduce and so on. Um, it's been about gobbling up technology, spitting out the stuff that doesn't work but not spitting everything out simply because there's something newer and so that is my approach and that's why I get it kind of goes back to my being in the studio I can use the computer and I can fuss and fuss and fuss over some digital like I'm writing trying to write photoshop like ICC codes to do stuff to an image but then I'm out with my exacto knife and my scissors and I'm playing and I'm making mock-ups with newsprint and taping them onto the wall. So I really see technology, you know, new technology, which universities do like to, you know, particularly I'm getting old, I'm becoming an old guy, but uh, I see the older guys saying, oh yes, we tech digital is the future. We can buy you this new, <laughs> this new scanner or this new laser cutter or whatever. And I just think, okay, well, so I have to make sure that I know how to fix the old stuff and keep using the old stuff and not throwing it out for no reason, um, but then gobbling up, kind of gobbling up this, this new stuff. My, I'll give you my 30-second spiel that I, I tell students um, and I tell deans and things when they come down to printmaking at the U of R. And they invariably want to see our letterpress. We've got this beautiful little Chandler and Price platen letterpress. It moves, it's Victorian, like it's all, it's amazing. And I say, you know, a 20 year old student took a picture this morning with their iPhone, ooh, iPhone, uh, with their iPhone. And then we go into my office and we work it up in Photoshop and we make a digital positive. And then we're into the dark room making a, a polymer plate and 45 minutes later, we've got that polymer plate locked up on a piece of aluminum next to some type from our collection that's 150 years old and we're printing it by hand with a foot powered printing press. And the students aren't making stuff that was being made 100 years ago. They're making art with this stuff and I'm making art with this stuff. And that's really my approach to technology is like, use it all. And if something doesn't work, don't be so quick to just chuck it out. Use the other thing. And you may find that you'll circle back to the stuff that you, uh, that, that you 
thought you couldn't use, or you'll find a reason to trust the laser cutter because you know you don't want to put all of your uh, you know all of your stock in the laser cutter per se. But if it becomes another tool that you can use, yeah, chew it up, use it. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Uh, and lastly, Jill, can you speak to us a bit about um, you know new techniques or new technologies that you're using? Um, I mean, I actually consider myself to be pretty analog. <laughs> I mean, I definitely use Photoshop, like Rob said, I use it every single day. Um, I will use it for like mock-ups and like you know to check to check out like scale and that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to like making actual prints, I'd say like 99% of my stuff is hand drawn. Um, and I, I, I see the allure of like a lot of these new technologies like CNC routing and like laser cutting. I just, I don't think I've used them because I don't feel I need them in my practice. Um, like that fence piece I showed, I mean, technically, I guess I could have got it laser cut, um, but I think like for me, the idea of like hand labor is quite important to my practice. Um, and I mean, new technologies are great. I'm not writing them off, but they're not, they're not like the panacea to everything, right? So if you wanted to laser cut a piece like that fence piece, you'd have to test it. You'd have to test it on all these different papers at different depths, all this kind of stuff. And it's like, do I want to spend all the time doing that? Or can I just like, I know I can do it by hand and I know I can get the results that I need to get. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think new technologies are great. I think they're... I, but I think they're like any other tool, right? Like drawing or painting. If they suit what you need to do conceptually and like visually, then by all means, um, by all means, use them. But if you don't need them, then you know your practice is not any lesser because you're grinding stones by hand or like drawing by hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer, Jill. Thank you. Um, and Victoria, I'm wondering if you have questions, any questions that we can now ask our panelists. Um, we just had that one question so far that's come through, but if anybody else in the audience has any questions, now is the time to type them in. Um, so I'll read out, um, I believe it's Isla's question. Um, she is asking, would you still be making prints if you did not have a teaching job? How much does teaching enable you to be in a print studio? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Nobody wants to go first. Um, That's fine. <laughs> Erica, you were making, you were opening your mouth. <laughs> Um, I, well, yeah, it's hard. It, it, it's, it's hard to say. It, it's, um, I think once you learn to make prints and I mean, the fact is there are co-ops around there's, there's, it's available, even if you're not at, at teaching at a university, I just feel really lucky that I get to work in a studio, A, beside the students and B with, with stuff that's well, I'm, that's, I'm well equipped here. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish we had more space, but I'm well equipped in terms of, of, of stuff. And I think it would be much more difficult and it will be much more difficult as I move towards retirement to continue doing the things that I do, but it'll just morph into something else. But I, it, it will still be print-based because that's um, that's how I think. Thank you. I'll just, I'll jump in there and, and add, um, you know, what, what Briar said about co-ops the importance of those of those co-ops or artist run centers community print shops is so uh i guess I, this is just me making a plug for the importance of government funding uh or and private funding as well um we we have to keep hopefully holding uh holding our governments accountable to arts arts spending i think i would be making prints um, but probably not with the consistency, perhaps, you know, like making, you know, large multicolor lithographs, you know, 
every couple months, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I like to think that I would save them all up, you know, save up all these films and drawings and then do a residency and just pump them out. Um, but, but that scenario that Rob talked about where you've got this image on this iPad and it goes into Photoshop and becomes a polymer plate. And then you're, you know, that, that beautiful synthesis, um, would be hard. Yeah. I'm very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Erica. Anyone else like to answer that question or should I? I'd, I'd like to the... believe that, um, yeah. I, I would be, and I, and I think I would, and I think I would find ways to do it, but, uh, as each year goes by and I find myself more and more continually amazed by like my job and the space that I have and what I'm valued for, uh, I, I find it harder and harder to believe that I could be doing anything other than living under a bridge and screaming at cars going by if I didn't have a job as a professor. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I'd like to be making prints, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, you know, there's a, there's a point where, uh, Rob at this age as a prof and Rob at this age as something else entirely might be very, very different. I don't know what, I don't exactly know what it is. I think we all yeah, love the I'll idea just... of living under a bridge and screaming at cars. <laughs> um, I'll just know? add really, I'll just add really briefly that um, uh, I think I would still be making prints, but probably not in the same way that I'm making them now. Um, I mean, definitely like they would be a lot smaller and probably um, just because per making is so equipment um, mm -hmm. focused, um, I think I would probably save like the real, the real sort of like conceptually deep, like really sort of laborious stuff, I probably would be working in a different medium just because it, you know, there is community print shops for sure. Um, but there's something, and again, I recognize like the privilege I have of, of being a professor and having access to these studios. And it's, um, there's something about having access to that stuff all the time that allows you to invest in more laborious projects, right? Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's somewhat interesting that, you know, just a little over two years ago, we were all sent home. And mm -hmm. in that moment, you know, what three quarters of four fifths of the way through the, the term, suddenly the, sh the, the building shut down and no one was allowed to be in the studio. And I took a bunch of stuff home and it was kind of, it was horrifying. It was terrifying. Obviously, the horrible thing that was happening uh, in, in relative to the pandemic, but it was also sort of exciting that well, I'm going to be doing something different. And and I literally took tons of linoleum home and I started playing with with lead type because I've got I've been collecting lead type for years. I didn't actually do any printing, but I was getting ready to. And then suddenly, I was able to come back to the studio. But I, I, I kind of been, you know we did have an experience not that long ago that we were probably all thrown out of our studios and we probably maybe didn't make prints the way we did before but I think we were all probably probably making pl making plans to do it on some level mm. find a way yeah we get creative <laughs> um Briar you could probably address this question um how accessible are print co-ops with presses and etc in small towns like Kelowna well, um, Isla Crawford has added um, a comment afterwards that yes. Printmaking Society has has a, a co-op. I mean, obviously, major cities tend to have print co-ops that are quite accessible. Um, Calgary has at least one. Edmonton has one. Vancouver, um, Toronto, certainly. Um, it. Um, I think there's. I think there's ways to to. You know, we don't have one in Kelowna. There's one in, in Kamloops. We are trying to do something here, and I've proposed it a couple of times, and I think the university can't quite wrap their heads around what it means. But given their uh, the mandate to have community engagement, we're trying to create a, a one credit course, so not a course that would be a third the cost of the normal course, where experienced printmakers come and work in our printmaking studio at UBCO. And I think it's maybe, uh, maybe it's a novel idea. I don't know whether anyone else is doing that, but it's it's a way to try to create opportunities for grads once they graduated they can come they still can live in Kelowna and still make prints 
and for a relatively minimal amount of money. Mm. I mean, obviously students can come back and take courses all the time. Anybody can sign up for, for a class and I'm really happy to take experience premieres in any classes without prerequisites and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that's one option. And, and, I, and I think we're, we're toying with the idea. It's again, just trying to get it through the system of we have to make a course that is doing something that isn't necessarily about teaching people for something, but about creating an opportunity and we'll see how, how it goes. It hasn't been successful yet, but we, we keep trying. Well, I think that leads well into our next question here from Ruben. Um, after years of teaching, has your exposure to your students' art had a creative impact on the stuff that you make? I'll let anyone go first. <laughs> I'm going to say without a doubt, um, if for no other reason than, um, I mean, it's, there's too many reasons. I think just being around people that are thinking differently than me all the time is fantastic because it's, it exposes me to different ways of looking at things. And I think my experience and my way of looking at artwork or looking at the world is so formed by the different ways that other people present those things to me um, in a class. So. I don't think there's any way you can go, uh, you can avoid being affected by the things your students do. Um, and, and, and again, for no other reason than they make mistakes I didn't make. And they're doing, they're having successes that I never have. And that's fantastic. You know, it's always a, it's always a learning experience every day for, for me, probably more so than, than, than the students. Because I think mostly people, students are thinking they're learning from me and I'm learning from all of them. And, and that's pretty that's a pretty terrific and a privileged place to be um yeah I, i'll just leave it at that i'll i'll add to that too um i it's been a really special privilege to be around and we we have students of all ages um but to be around young people so frequently um and to be reminded what you know what matters in in their world what the world was like you know when they were growing up and how that was different um but you know to have that in a class or in a in a community environment um where then there's also somebody uh in their mid 50s or early 70s who you know is engaging with that that 20 year old at the same time you know i get to witness that and and of course right like briar said of course like there's no way to be in this world without that influencing the way we make and think and and uh also realize that the rosin and is just not working with this etch <laughs> like like thank god thanks for saving me you know 20 hours um, and, and I, yeah, I think Ruben's question works really well with Nicholas's below it too. And, um, and I, I'll, I'll pass to somebody else for the moment though. Yeah. I'll go ahead and read Nicholas's question. And if anyone wants to answer that along the way, it'd be a good way to end our conversation. Um, so Nicholas asks, how does community get created in a print shop? As an undergrad, I thought it sort of just happened, but I'm now realizing a lot of care goes into it and was wondering if you had any advice for fostering community in print shops. Um, I think like you said, Robert, just from a glimpse of your studio and knowing it's right there next to all of the action, you probably have some experience with that. I, I think that um, when community is really working in a studio, um, uh, I was really drawn to printmaking because of the community, but in reality, I think like maybe many, or maybe not, I'll just say for me, I hate almost everyone. I don't want to be around people. I don't really like people. I can perform well on Zoom or in front of a class, um, but, um, but all that aside, I really did enjoy the community. I really did enjoy walking in, maybe becoming my, like one of my best friends and I, to this day, printmaker, um, but then also just knowing that there's other people in there that kind of care about their own particular weird thing that they're doing that I also kind of care about. And I think that the best kind of community in a studio is one that I think Nicholas alludes to this initially, is that it seems like it's just happened. You know, it's just this wonderful, wonderful place. Um, and, and I don't know that it's, 
it's laid out piece by piece in order to create that community. But there's certainly a lot of care that has to go into the community. You have to feel like the other people around you care about the stuff that they're doing. They kind of care about some of the things that you care about. Um, you know, they're there maybe because they want to be around you, even if they don't know you very well, you know, like the whole community, um, I think pieces have to be put in place, but then it does also have to kind of be an organic, an organic kind of a thing. So that was a bit of a rambling uh, answer towards the end of our long talk here, but um, community, community is super, super, super important. And it doesn't just happen. All the people that are involved in it have to have to want it, whether they realize it or not. I think actually yeah. something you oh. said there was really interesting. So, sorry, Joe, go ahead. Oh, um, I'll just quickly say like, I, I think part the, one of the most important parts about building a good community within a print shop is everybody like understanding that, that there needs to be like a level of respect. So like, respect of the physical print shop and like um also respect of respect that everybody might do something a little bit differently because printmakers are very particular like we find a way we like to work and then we sort of get it in our heads that that's the only way to do it which is not the case um and then yeah like you know like maybe someone's doing some weird project you don't understand, but you respect that and you're like, okay, that's weird. I don't really understand it, but I also think it's really cool that you're into it. Um, so yeah, I think like uh, people respecting each other, regardless of where they are on like the art career scale or the experience scale, I think that's like super important. Wonderful. Thanks for all of your answers, everyone. Um, we are getting a little bit long in the wind here, and I, I think we've uh, exhausted everyone's resources. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, artists. Thank you, printmakers. Thank you, Christine. Um, and thank you uh, to everybody who showed up tonight. Um, if there's anything anyone would like to say in closing, now is the time. Um, but that's it for me for, for tonight. I'll, I mean, I'll just say, obviously, this this um, I, I'm, this is my home base, the Kelowna and the Kelowna Art Gallery. Um, so I just re really appreciate that Rob and Joe and and Erica were um, took the time to come in and do this. And again, we're talking about, about community, and you know, we're we're spanning the country pretty much, and we've all come together to have a chat and to pass information along to other people. And and I think that's that's really the spirit. And I, I kind of agree with Rob. I think it's interesting. I I, I don't I kind of like solitude. I kind of want to be in the studio by myself, but then I really, when once I have that in the summertime, I kind of wish that someone was around to be doing something that would be interesting. And and it's so it's it's always amazing to me when people come together, and um, it seems like this magical thing somehow. No, oh, thanks, Briar. <laughs> I second that. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. And for anyone who's in Kelowna this weekend, Briar is actually doing an open house at the uh, studio here at UBCO. So if you're around, go check it out. I highly recommend it. Um, yay. <laughs> and also his exhibition, Read Me, which is what this is all in collaboration with, is currently up at the Kelowna Art Gallery until April 14th, I believe, Christine. Am I right? Yes. yes. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everyone. Really appreciate your time this evening, and um, I'm sure we'll see you all soon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for having us.